TV you heard was um, my YouTube coming to life on the channel. So. All righty, everybody. <laughs> it's Thursday night. This is Real Monsters. I'm your host, SK Barrett, joined by the lovely and talented Wes Hobrick and special guest, Kelly Evans. Hey, hello. How you doing? Hello, hello, hello. So, what the hell are we doing tonight? <laughs> I, I had a few entries for the This Week in Crime. Ah. Um, let's see. The first one I had on there is August 22nd, 1961. Britain's A6 murders. Those were apparently uh, Zodiac style. Two lovers shot on an isolated road. Um, A6. Yeah, the A6. Um, James Herity was convicted and hanged for it, but real questions surround his guilt. Um, Oh, uh, so what part of England was this? Was this around London? I believe so. I could be wrong there, but yeah, A6, I think, is a major thoroughfare. Uh, Yeah. Let's see. August 24th, 1981. Mark Chapman gets 20 years for shooting John Lennon. 20 years. Yeah, that seemed a little low to me when I read that. But maybe not. August 25th, 1993. A neo Nazi sniper shoots American Nazi Party leader George Lincoln Rockwell twice in the head. He died from his wounds. Wow. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, that's really all I had there with the history and then a little bit of news. I am really kind of chomping at the bit to talk about that uh, cannibal story, but I think we're going to leave that for another show. Um, oh, yeah, I think, I think we talked about <laughs> doing a, a cannibal special. Yes. Yeah. For those who don't know, it's a um, guy out of Jefferson County, Indiana, uh, the southern part of the state, who uh, beat his girlfriend's head in, basically, and then took in eight pieces of her brain, in particular. Uh, Listen, if you're gonna... (laughs) Don't, just don't. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna... You know, not that the is brain, a, not the brain. <laughs> it, exactly. That's the most parasite ridden when you usually do that, when animals eat them. But, um, yeah, there really wasn't a whole lot else going on. I mean, Harvey Weinstein, two new indictments, and he's looking to ship his trial somewhere that is not Manhattan. Honestly, I would be inclined to let him do that. <clears throat> you know? Sorry, there. That's just because... There's a, that's one less thing he can bitch about when he inevitably takes it to appeal. If you yeah. were to let him have this now, but I mean, yeah, that's all I got for that. Okay. Well, we are here to talk about a couple of old timey murderers or murders, <laughs> Murderesses. and they ha- both happen to be named Elizabeth. They do. And neither one of them is royalty. <laughs> no, they are not. In the traditional sense. And we've got a... Uh, uh, you know, I failed to really work up a lot of puns on this, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to work them in. Hopefully they'll come to mind along the way. Um, anyway, so... It- you don't want to get them all out of your system now. You're going to sprinkle them throughout. This is our Liz Bertarian show. Um, okay. So who do we want to do next first? Do we want to do, we've got Lizzie Halliday and we've got Lizzie Borden, who a lot of people will have heard of. So do you want to start with Lizzie Halliday maybe? And then Lizzie Borden, there's yeah. kind of a lot more going on, despite the fact that Lizzie Halliday should have a hell of a lot more written about her, let me tell you. Yeah, she was something, man. She was... I'm um... just looking for her. <laughs> she was odd <laughs> in more ways than one. And they were both um, they were both killing around the same time. So Lizzie mm-hmm. Halliday... Um, 
she was born around 1859 and Lizzie mm -hmm. Borden, um, 1860. So they're roughly the same age, roughly the same time period. There she is. Um, that's a sketch of her. Um, How many children were in the Borden family? Just, um, just the two of them, Lizzie. And oh. I was just yeah. looking at that with the compare and contrast because, uh, Lizzie Halliday was one of 10 children. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um she was she was actually um she was actually um born in Ireland um and then moved over to the states when she was um quite young we we think less than 10 um and yeah. i guess irish catholic families at the time um had sort of very it was tradition of very large families it was and after they got there and got settled a little bit in new york city um lizzie actually found a job where she went and worked as a maid for a family in Pennsylvania, be quite a commute there on that one. Um, and her violent reputation was also rather well known by the time she took this job on the really? streets of NYC. Yeah, um, I, primarily from selling her body, things like that. But she met a man named Charles Hopkins in Pennsylvania, um, married him in 1879, had one son. Who ended up institutionalized, apparently. I, I did a bit more digging, and I really couldn't find anything else about him. I don't know if how, how long he lived, or, um, or I couldn't find anything about the actual reason for institutionalizing him. Mm-hmm. That's it's, weird. It's a bit odd, yeah. Um, it, so Was it a that. setup? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I, it, I know a lot. At the time, a lot of um, sort of wealthier people, if they did have... Um, someone in the family who didn't quite fit right or didn't quite act right or maybe had a minor mental illness, they, they would lock them away. Right. They would. Yeah, I don't know whether I would chalk that one up to, like you were saying, malice or maybe even just incompetence on their part. They didn't know what, you know, they were doing. So they would, resort would, to that. I wouldn't call, I would be a bit kinder. I, I wouldn't call it incompetence. I would tell you at the time, just the overwhelming sense of we have this son, what do we do with them? Here's someone who's able to help. At the time, I think they actually genuinely thought they might be able to help. So, Oh, I, will, oh, I didn't mean the them. I meant the doctors. Oh, the doctors. Oh, I thought you meant the why did they institutionalize <laughs> no. their son? No. No, I mean, the science isn't exactly good at this time either for no, no. You know, mental health. No, for anything. Yeah. Except yeah, maybe but... astrophysics. <laughs> but science, <laughs> medical science was pretty... Harsh. Mm, wow. But, um, yeah, it wasn't long after that that Mr. Hopkins apparently died. The um, only cause of death that I found was determined to be natural. Yeah, that's him. all I found. It was two years later, though, so it really didn't last very long. Mm-hmm. And then you keep following her sordid history there. She next finds a, um army officer from Greenwich Village. And Mary Sim, that was Artemis Brewster. He he was a pensioner. Just I just want to bring that up because she she kind of falls into a pattern of marrying older men. Oh, Black Widow style. So I'm assuming pensioner means the same thing then then as it does now. A pensioner like an older gentleman. Yeah, retired. Mm -hmm. Living yeah. on a pension. Absolutely. But... Um, which could be a lot or a little depending on the origin of the pension. Exactly, yeah. But That's... I think Brewer, but Brewer was a, um, I think he was in the army, so he probably had a pretty substantial pension. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine so. I mean, even back then with Greenwich Village, too, it was, you know, a nicer area. But, yeah, um, yeah the cause of death was unknown, and she moved on to Brewster, and this also was not a happy marriage for her. Um, she constantly mistreated him according to the source that I was reading. And yeah. he dies about one year after meeting her. Yeah. Um, this so, time, so, the cause so of death was So guys don't unfair. have a lot of longevity with this lady. <laughs> nope. Not at all. And, and the thing is, is in those days, you know, you kind of have to take people at their word. I mean, you either trust what they tell you or you don't trust it, because there's not a lot of sources to go to to research somebody's background, right? 
So, no, not at all. So if some, you know, if, if, for example, if she says, well, no, I've never been married before. <laughs> well, how are you going to know that she's <laughs> telling the truth or not? Yeah, I mean, the best thing that you could even possibly do is try to track down the church where it happened. Yeah, you know? that's a lot of work when, you know, you meet somebody you like, you're just going to go with what they tell you. Unless yeah, something comes up to, you know, make you doubt that. But it's more more likely nothing's going to happen, you know, make you doubt them. You're just well, going to go, oh, well, that's what they said. Okay. Well, the interesting thing about Brewer is not only is there no suspicion of any of any wrongdoing, um, she 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 marries her third husband, who leaves her within a, the first year of their marriage, and then her fourth husband is actually he's someone who served with her second husband, oh. Warren, George husband. George yeah, Smith, yeah. yeah. So if he had suspected that she had killed Brewer, then why the heck would he marry her? <laughs> right. Well, and that even gets weirder, but um, again, with Brewster, they found his cause of death to be unknown. Yeah. So not as, you know, shitty as the first time, but... No. So and, then the third she's... Husband, and then the third husband left her, so he escaped. <laughs> Narrowly. <laughs> Narrowly. She actually made an attempt on his life with arsenic lace tea. No, that was the fourth one. Uh, George Smith, right? Yeah, I was talking about Hiram Parkinson. He left her oh. within oh, the first okay. of marriage. And then after that, she went on to marry her fourth husband, who was George Smith, and she tried to kill him by poisoning him. And yeah, he, he actually lived as well. Okay. Yeah, my notes are a bit out of order. So she's probably devolving. Well, she nothing happened. She fled. She took everything. She took everything she could, everything portable out of the house and fled. Um, to Vermont, and then she married her fifth husband, um, which is a, a, a guy in Vermont called called Charles Playstill. But then she took all his stuff and vanished two weeks afterwards. That's <laughs> <Yeah, it's> too <laughs> So what by, what I mean by devolving is that she's becoming. I, I have to think that these guys who managed to escape are starting to pick up on clues, is what I mean. Like, like she's, would, she, her, her tells are showing. Yeah, yeah. one would hope so. But yeah, so we're at around, what, 1888 by then? Well, there's a couple of years where we kind of lost track of her, because if you count from, like, so for 1881 after Hopkins, um, that was when Hopkins died, the next husband was less than a year. The next husband was less than a year. So that's two years. Um, George Smith was, I think, also another year. Um, so we're looking actually at about 1881 and 83. So between 8045 and 88, we really don't have every reference. We don't know what she did. She could have killed more people. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, but yeah, she finally turns up again in the winter of 1888 in Philadelphia. And let's see. And then it was after that where she fled to upstate New York. Yeah, so basically okay. what happened, she actually, um, she met up with a couple of friends who she had known in Ireland, um, the McQuillans, and she actually started now calling herself Maggie Hopkins. Um, so a change of name, always highly suspicious. Um, she actually set up a little shop, but she was convicted of burning it down for the insurance money, um, which we've heard before. <laughs> She was sentenced to, um, two, she actually was sentenced, um, and she spent two years at um, the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. I don't know if you've visited there. It's awesome. If you can ever, if you get a chance to go do a tour there, do it. That's where Capone was incarcerated. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an amazing, oh, and at Halloween, they, they do a, a, like a giant haunted house terror thing that you walk through. It's awesome. I find it interesting in there how um, a lot of these downright medieval ways of torturing inmates came about from the Quakers. Like solitary confinement was one of their things. Yeah. No kidding. The, the yeah. pacifists. Yep. And a lot of the times back when Eastern State was in its heyday, they would force the inmates to wear hoods to where you couldn't, you know, see what the next person looked like. Just it, all about dehumanization. Yeah. And they thought that by doing that, they would get you closer to God. Was their theology, as wow. it were. Yep. It's also a great equalizer, isn't it? 
No one has better clothes than anybody else. No one has nicer mm. shoes or nicer hat or a better kind belt. Kind of Soviet or... like that, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, really is. But, you okay. know, like they also say about them, it's the dictators never have any trouble keeping order at all. You want mm. order? Go to a dictatorship. But, yeah, sorry, okay. that tangential just made me think of that. <laughs> Okay, so we went, so we've went from Easter State Penitentiary to dictatorship. That was that was pretty good. That was almost as good as the Loch Ness monster one a couple of times. Ago. <laughs> um, okay, we so specialize in, um, in distraction. <laughs> so we're we're now up to squirrel. We're, we're up to Maggie. Um, uh. Lizzie's now calling herself Lizzie Brown. She's out of prison. She's around thirty years old, and she goes to work for Paul Halliday, who is. Um, He's actually already had two wives. He's about 70 year, years old. He's a farmer. He lives in upstate New York, and she goes to be his housekeeper. Um, now, he eventually marries him. They say some some of the neighbors thought it was because so he didn't have to pay her, like he just wanted a free maid. Um, I don't know how true that is. It's sort of rumor at the time, but they eventually got married, and apparently Halliday described the marriage kind of, disrupted by her sporadic spells of insanity um so i don't i don't know what that means exactly i'm not sure what he meant um but about a year later she actually stole it she eloped with a neighbor she stole a team of horses um and drove um to another place in new york called newburgh he abandoned her there and she sold the horses and then eventually got caught again but she was acquitted on the grounds of insanity um, so I think what happened is she actually begged her husband to sort of take her back and said she was insane at the time, et cetera, et cetera. And he actually did take her back, hmm. um, even though she what? was trying to run off with some other guy and stole the horses. Um, so by the way, she, by the way, in those days, stealing a horse was a big deal. Yeah, she stole two. She stole, well, it says she stole a team, which I'm assuming is two. Two, at least two. Yeah, mm -hmm. at least two. Um, but it was, I mean, it was, you have to understand, it, it's not like taking a piece of livestock out of somebody's field today. It's stealing a horse from a, from a farm, um, you know, it could it could result in them starving to death, for example. Yeah, you're stealing someone's livelihood. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it was a huge deal. That's why they hung horse thieves, because you were threatening the lives of the people you stole from. Yep, absolutely. And she was acquitted. She managed to convince them that she was um, insane. Um, and then at the same time, <laughs> Paul, Paul Halliday took her back. <laughs> There's something kind of sadly hilarious about, oh, you kill, you, oh, you're you insane. Well, okay, you just go about being insane out in society again. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. As long as, you've got, as long as you've got a strong man to watch after you, you poor dear, then we'll let you go. No problem at all. <laughs> wow. Um, okay, so May 1891, so about another about a year or so later, um, the mill and the residence barn burned to the ground um, on the Halliday, so where she was living. And Halliday actually had a mentally handicapped son named John, and John happened to be in the barn when it burned. Um, she was suspected of setting the fire since she people had seen her sort of, you know, talking trash about John. She really didn't like him. She was arrested she was sent to another an asylum um she kind of acted up tremendously at that one so she was transferred to another one where they declared her cured after a little while and she was released again and returned home to holiday <laughs> again wow <clears throat> so now this is where things get come, interesting so Paul, doesn't he come in for some scolding for not keeping a tighter rein on his woman crazy woman uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure she does. If I could have found newspaper, um, like some of the, so there were newspaper articles, mostly it was a very sensational um, trial and everything. And I found a lot of newspaper articles on the trial itself, but I really couldn't find any that criticized him for not keeping an eye on her. But I'm sure, I'm sure someone somewhere must have commented on it. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so Paul Halliday disappeared um, in August of the same year. So May in 1891, the barn she burned. She we pretty much think she burned down the barn and killed the son. Um, in August of that year, um, Paul Halliday disappears. Now, when people ask where he's gone, she says, oh, I guess he was a mason of some sort. So she said he's gone on a job to do some mason work. Um, people didn't quite trust Lizzie. So they started getting a little bit suspicious. So they um, went to the local authorities and they met, and the police managed to get a search warrant and they searched the house. And on September 4th, the bodies of two women were found buried in the hay in the barn. Both of them had been shot. Not Paul, two women. Huh. The women the women were identified as Margaret and Sarah McKillen, the friends from Ireland that she actually stayed with. Um, so <laughs> she murdered her guests? Yeah, well, um, earlier that year, Sarah McKillen, the daughter, had actually gone to work with uh, or work for um, Lizzie as a maid. Now, why her mother was there, I, I don't know. I couldn't find out. I did do some searching. But we do know that Sarah went to work as a maid at the Halliday house. So maybe mum was visiting or maybe, I don't know, maybe Sarah didn't like it there and was trying to leave and Margaret came to lend her some support. I don't know. But yeah, they were both found um, covered up in hay and both of them had been shot. Now, when they questioned Lizzie, she behaved completely erratically. She was just talking, talking nonsense, mumbling, tearing at her clothes, tearing at her hair. Um, a lot of the people at this point now, she was kept in custody, but a lot of people think she was faking it. Mm. So there's a suspicion going. Now, a few days after this, um, they were still well, searching. I mean, it, when you don't have a psych psychiatric field of study except very rare and very rudimentary. Well, you know, it was in all you got to do is, age. you know, yeah. put on a good show and people are going, oh, shit, she's crazy. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> yeah, I'm still see it as kind of a toss up whether she was malingering or not. I mean, we'll never know for sure, but explain what malingering is. Malingering is just faking your disorder to try to get out of something, usually. It has to be oriented toward an external goal. So in this case, if you are trying to fake a mental disorder to get off of a murder rap, you are malingering. Right. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, a lot of people actually were suspecting that, though. So One of the anyway, great malingering um, malingerers of real monsters uh, this summer was Son of Sam. And yes. he actually he actually yeah. admitted to it later to the um, FBI that it was all bullshit that mm -hmm. the stuff about the dog talking to him and stuff. That's yep, scary. David Berkowitz. Well, um, okay, so she's in custody, and some people think she's faking it because she's just acting complete nonsense. Um, so the police are still searching her house, and they start to smell something. So they check under the like the boards and the. Um, of the house, and there is Paul Halliday's mutilated body. Um, he had also been shot. Under the boards of the house, telltale heart board. style? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so she was charged, she was charged with um, all three of the murders. She was held um, in jail in Monticello. Mon Monticello. Um, during her first few months there, though, this is where it gets interesting, because the malingering sort of comes in, and, and the extent that she goes to if it is actual malingering. So she refuses to eat to such an extent that they have to tube feed her up her nose. She attacked the wife's, uh, the sheriff's wife. Um, she set fire to her bed. She tried to hang herself. She cut her own throat and arms with broken glass. And she said, I thought I would cut myself to see if I would bleed. Um, at this point, her jailers were forced to chain her to the floor for her remaining months there for her own safety. Mm -hmm. Wow. So. The thing is, refusing to eat. Eating is a, a human impetus. You, it, you know. So, was her malingering that strong that she refused to eat? Was you really? You still think? And having food forced down your nose, you really think she was still faking? I honestly, I don't know. If you look at everything in there, um, you know all the facts of the case. And it, to me, it would suggest when you get that far that. 
I don't know. Some, there might be something. Yeah, because I can. There see might that. be something. Yeah. Wearing your clothes, t talking nonsense is great, but when you actually stop eating and you have to be force fed, and you actually cutting your throat with and and your arms with glass, and I don't know, it just it seems she tried to hang herself. It just seems like interesting. It's gone a little uh, bit. In the comments, uh, Mr. Deadman says, "I've seen patients starve on purpose." Mm hmm. But aren't they trying to make some sort of political point? No, he's talking Not about in custody. Oh, I see. Okay. I mean, and it, you know, even looking at like um, the difference between malingering and uh, Munchausen, well, or Munchausen saying, by proxy. I'm just saying that Mr. Dudman's comment about how a client is starved because they associated eating food to hurting people. Well, that's like a uh, like a, uh, a psychological aversion to food because you're associating it with something else. There's there's nothing like that with this woman. She just stopped eating. Like we can't, I, I couldn't find a reason for why. Um, I'd love someone to write a book on someone professional, like a, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, to write a book on this woman because they're I both on. Um, they both rely on delusions, though, as false yeah. beliefs. The person that Deadman's seen, it has that, but do we know we of any that she had? We don't know. That's yeah, the problem. That's the problem with either secondhand newspaper reports or rumors or reading about stuff it just we don't know why she but she did it to the extent they were worried about her health and they had to force feed her so mm -hmm. that's that's a good that's a good week or two isn't it um, that's, a long, that's a long time to go without food it just seems weird yeah yeah, yeah. Anyway, it is see, but anyway, it, so you know it, it's it depends on you know i could see it if Let's let's assume that she had been malingering to that point. Yeah. And if she got the sense that you know her uh, her act is dropping, her, her act is failing to get the results yeah. she wanted, she would have to so up her getting, game. So she's upping her game because she's desperate. That's one possibility. Buying okay. her own bullshit, basically. After yeah. a while. Well. What, for whatever, what it it got her, her it got her some negative attention. Her jailers then chained her to the floor. Um, but while she was in jail, is interesting. I was going through some newspaper articles, and um, she it received national attention, like coast to coast. Um, it was just one story after another came out after her. And as soon as they started talking about, you know, they talked to neighbors, and a neighbor would say some odd comment, and the newspaper articles would start all over again, and um, so she was, it was, she was pretty much a celebrity in the newspaper so much so that, um, I don't know if you know who Nellie Bly is. She was a reporter at the time. Female oh yeah. Reporter. Yeah. Did yeah. She go undercover yeah. into the into yeah. 10 the, days in the nut house is the name yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. She had herself committed so that she could report on the condition of, um, of patients in these places. And she actually, um, interviewed Lizzie twice. Um, and it was really? actually, it was actually, she spoke to Nizzy Bly, it was actually Nizzy Bly who managed to get her to reveal that she had previous marriages. Um, so, so Bly was able to go in and uh, look at all that stuff. Is that um, in that book? That interview, is it in her book about that? I have I read the book. I didn't know. I didn't know, because the book is about, the book that Nellie Bly wrote is specifically about her own personal um, dealings within within the psych ward she kept a diary and she and she reported on everything it wasn't about others other people like any of her other interviews hmm. i wonder well, if i could find that by the I'd way be interested in reading it yeah nelly yeah, bly was portrayed some of the stuff is some of the stuff she reports is terrifying <laughs> yeah nelly bly bly was portrayed by none other than laura dern on drunk history one of my favorite oh my shows God. that's okay i definitely have to go actually i think i saw that one okay yeah. Um, anyway, I found I found a quote from so the new the New York World um, um, had this quote about her. It said, "From its circumstances, origin, conception, and execution, its unique characteristics, the abnormal personalities and peculiar localities it involves, and above all, in the strangeness and mystery of its great central figure, it is unprecedented and almost without parallel in the annals of crime." <laughs> that's the that's the quote about the. Um, about the, the the crimes in her in general <laughs> so she shocked she really shocked yeah well they didn't have good researchers because it really wasn't as unprecedented as they claimed <laughs> no I, well, yeah. well actually yeah speaking of which um so one of the 
when I said that, um, like Nellie Bly was reporting on her and reporters were all over the place. And every time someone said something, there'd be a whole other flurry of activity. Um, there was a County Sheriff, um, in the area and he started a whole new round of speculation in newspaper articles. And cause he told the press that Lizzie was probably Jack the Ripper. With oh, no proof whatsoever. <laughs> uh-huh. um, now she was, she was in Europe at the time and I, I, I can't, find out what she was doing there but um she may have actually married and killed another man while she was actually over there but there's absolutely no evidence that she was jack the ripper in fact when this county sheriff said are you guilty um did you do it she actually replied do you think i'm an elephant that was done by a man so yeah (laughs) so she denies it and i would absolutely agree with her assessment there yeah yeah just because she Um, was on the island around that time is not enough evidence. Oh well, yeah, I'm sure she had you know butter on her bread and <laughs> milk when she went out and ate meat, too, marmalade. But... Yeah. Well the, other, well, the other thing is that she probably wasn't even in England at the time. She was probably in Ireland visiting, right. you know, visiting. So she relatives. was on a different island entirely. Island. Yeah, completely. Um, so they figured out that she probably, and this is interesting about the visit because she, she probably killed, they reckon she killed about six people. Um, cause they kind of group in the two husbands that died less than a year. Um, and she tried to poison the third. So they, they reckon probably about six people. Um, and the New York times said whether these men died natural deaths or murdered, it's not known. But, um, something interesting that actually did happen is one of the people that they called to, um, to speak to the reporters was um, Paul Halliday had an older son called Robert Halliday. And Robert Halliday actually apparently said, he said, confided, you know, she confided to him that she had killed a husband in Belfast but had managed to conceal the crime. That would suggest that during the time of Jack the Ripper thing, she was probably in Belfast. Killing Whether people. she killed this guy <laughs> or not, we don't know. Mm-hmm. Remember, this, is the, this is the son of the murdered guy, so we don't know whether he was lying or he was trying to get her in trouble. or. But, uh. you know, it's just... <laughs> Um, so well, she was being so being her one, husband was not a good career choice for anybody. No, no. Um, she was convicted um, on in 1894, June 21st. She became the first woman ever to be sentenced to death by electrocution. Um, new York State had just come up with this brand spanking new way to execute people, the electric chair. Um, so they decided she would go that way. But the governor at the time commuted her sentence because he he declared her insane. So she was sent to um, a, a Matawayan hospital, state hospital for the criminally insane, um, where she spent the rest of her life. Now, one incident, so she died in 1918, but one incident in 1906, um, there was a nurse, Nellie Wicks, who apparently was very, very close to Lizzie, and she said she was going to leave for um, other employment. So Lizzie got upset and stabbed her 200 times. Jesus. Yeah, that's some overkill right there. Got a pair of scissors and yeah. Man. Uh, So yeah, there's nothing unusual about her death. She just died of, you know, old age, natural causes sort of thing. She spent the rest of her life in this um, criminally insane mental institution. So yeah, that's, it's... Yeesh. So I, I don't know if if any of you, either of you, anybody has an explanation. But in a couple of these uh, news clips, they call her an ex gypsy queen. What the hell is that all about? I uh, didn't see anything in regard because, to that. It's 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 because they're not being very nice. When you call people gypsies, especially from Ireland, it's not particularly a nice thing. It just means they're sort of like. Um, gypsies in Ireland are basically, um, they call themselves travelers. They generally just travel from city to city and oh, they, they set yeah. themselves up in, in a farmer's field and they're, they're reputed to have, you know, to have powers, lucky powers, or, you know, or they could curse you or things like that. In fact, in London these days, you can still see gypsies, um, out on the streets, um, like Oxford street, for example. And what they do is they'll ask for a donation and they'll give you a little twig of lavender with, you know, a little bit of tinfoil on it, a little blessing. Um, so probably I would imagine they're using that as some sort of slur just because she's Irish and she had dark hair. I think you're right with that. I always, I don't know why, but I always, whenever I think of gypsy, think of Eastern European. 
Well, that's I mean, where, I know that. that's kind of where they the actual gypsies originated. It was like Romania, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's the Roman. They're they're a different group at the moment, but yeah, I guess way 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 back they they might have been part of the the same the same group of people. I'm not sure. Okay. It, it, it's just the problem is calling them gypsies because every gypsies is like a giant category for a whole bunch of different types. So you've got the Roma um, in in Europe, and then you've got the you know you've you've got the travelers in Ireland, and you know that sort of thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So, so it's just, be this is just a big slur on her. It, I would imagine, yeah. God, then they then they have a better slur for a, for an <laughs> Irish person than gypsy. Gypsy was pretty bad. <laughs> if you weren't a gypsy, it was it was a pretty bad insult. Wow. So yeah, that's poor Lizzie Holiday. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the tragic story of Lizzie Holiday. Now we get on to the even more tragic story of Lizzie Borden. Lizzie, Lizzie Borden. Do you wanna do you wanna take a break and try some puns or anything between the women or <laughs> no? Is it still okay. <laughs> Oh man, I little I, little palate cleanser between the two between the two killers. <laughs> no. Okay, no, so I was trying to remember. I was trying to remember the nursery rhyme. Oh for, my god, I know the nursery Borden. rhyme, but you just asked me where it came about, and you know, I feel like an idiot. I don't actually know where it came about. Huh. Oh, that's how stupid. Um, so oh, well, should we start with the nursery rhyme? Everybody, okay, so actually, I, I know what I know about Lizzie Borden. Tell me what you know about her, and then we'll, we'll fill in some of the facts. Okay, so the nursery rhyme is Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, gave her father 41. Um, and apparently it's a, it was written by an anonymous writer as a tune to sell newspapers. Um, some people think it's the um, anonymous Mother Goose person, but apparently it was written to sell newspapers. I remember apparently that, it's I called remember a that one as a kid. Yeah, that I, could be. I have never heard that term before. The dog dog roll? roll. D-O-G-G-E-R-E-L. Yeah, I have heard that term before. Huh. Uh, let me see. What is... A dog roll is poetry that is irregular in rhyme and in in rhythm and rhyme, often deliberately so this is, this for definitely... burlesque or comic effect. This is definitely not a dog or roll. It's too, it's too rhythmic. And apparently the correct way to say it is, I guess, singing it to the tune of tra la la boom die <laughs> tra la la boom die Lizzie Borden took an axe. No, don't believe it. And gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. I don't know. Uh, I'm not so sure about that one. If it would fit that rhythm, it would definitely, that would break the doggerel um, definition. So it can be one or the other. Little, how about a little bit of folklore? But every, every child, so you guys knew that rhyme, right? Because, I mean, I'm... I'm I absolutely Canadian. knew that as a kid. Okay, when did you first hear it? When do kids in America first become aware of this rhyme? Grade school. Okay. Through school or just through someone saying it? I don't recall. Somebody uh, saying it. I think we okay. had I think we had an after school special of Lizzie Borden nursery rhyme. An after school special, <laughs> just, really? I'm totally making that up. <laughs> Didn't Hallmark make those after school specials? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody took us aside in the playground and taught us that rhyme. You know, it's one of those things. It's one of those things. It's like, how does how does shit get past? Keep getting passed down from generation to generation. You know. Um, they keep remaking movies. If they stop making movies about her, then I don't know. Yeah. That's just. A- but there is, well, there have been you know, so many w- TV shows. And... This was well, you know, there weren't any Lizzie Borden shows that I recall seeing. Are you kidding? As a there child. Been... Oh, as a child. No, but recent, there's been like a, a, a resurgence of interest in her. There oh, was, um, uh, yeah. There was, was... A, 
There was a TV show, what, The Lizzie Diaries or something um, on Netflix? Something like that. If someone in the chat can help me out with that, I've not actually seen it. I have not seen any of them, anything, any shows about her that I can recall. Well, that the ones just... that I recall are more about the house in Fall River than well, her okay. so much. And so hauntings. Yes. In, okay, so there's a movie in the 70s with Elizabeth Montgomery about her. And then there was another one with the woman who was in Twilight. That was a few years ago. And then there was a TV series on last year or the year before about her called like the, the Lizzie Diaries or something like that. Um, there's all kinds of movies. The one oh, with man, the, if Elizabeth Montgomery was in a show, I would have made every effort to see it. <laughs> you should watch it. It's actually quite a good movie. Um, I haven't seen the one with, I, I, I'm really sorry, I can't remember her name, the, the person in Twilight, the one who falls in love with the vampire. Uh, the the actress's name. I just she dropped the Lizzie Borden Chronicles in the chat Lizzie there. Borden, thank you, yes. Kristen thank you, Stewart, I believe her name is. Yes. Kristen Stewart, I don't see her on the cast list for this one, though. No, she's not on the TV show. There was another movie that she was in where apparently she investigated the theory that um, Lizzie Borden was a lesbian and that caused problems and her father got angry and that's why she actually murdered her father. So, oh, I wonder if that's just, the one that's just called Lizzie. Maybe, I think I saw yeah. a preview for that the other day. Okay, I've not actually seen that one, but I did see the, the one with Elizabeth Montgomery. <laughs> I don't think it's been out that long. Why would anybody the Lizzie watch one? anything but yeah, from, there's, there's with a lot Kristen of, there's Stewart? Still, there's still a lot of interest. Um, there's still a huge amount of interest. And if you look at the number of books um, that are still being written about her, there's still, and the number of people doing PhD studies on her, there, she's still, for some reason, very, very popular. Um, there's, there's, even the people that don't think she's innocent, that, you know, agree that she probably did it, are still fascinated by her. Um, and one of the things that I, I watched a show, a woman was um, doing her PhD is, not on Lizzie anymore, but the fascination of Lizzie. So it's actually gone an, an extra step now. Borden mania is what they call it. Yeah, it's still alive and well, I've, I've found, just doing a little bit more research on here. Wow. So, Apparently, be... Kristen Stewart plays uh, Bridget Sullivan in that oh, she movie. Oh, Sullivan. Okay, awesome. Cool. Okay, so let's, we'll take a bit, go back a little bit. Same, same time period as our Lizzie Halliday. She was born um, 1860. And um, she was born in Massachusetts. She, obviously, everybody knows she was responsible for the murder of her father. And it's actually not her mother. It was her stepmother that she killed. And obviously, it wasn't 40 wax. So we'll get into that. Um, she, through her father, she was of English and Welsh descent. He struggled financially as a kid. But when they actually, um, when he was on his own, he actually became very, very, very successful. He actually made quite a lot of money. He prospered in manufacture. Um, he, he sold um, caskets, furniture. He was a property developer. He was a director at textile mills. Um, he owned a lot of property. He was um, a president at like a bank. They reckon that at the time of his death, his estate was valued at, in, in 2018 numbers, it was valued at $8.3 million. So yeah, their, house, <laughs> their house is very large and very nice. Well, that's, is that, so is, okay, well, which house? I don't know, the one in the pictures. Fall <laughs> River. Okay, so let me, let me, so basically the house that she grew up in, even though he was making a lot of money, um, it, it was in the wrong part of town for the people who had, it wasn't a fashionable neighborhood. The, the, the place uh, where um, even her cousins and the people that they should be associating with, because they were quite wealthy, was called the Hill. But um, she, they, he didn't want to live there. Um, so he lived in a really simple home, no indoor plumbing, no electricity, even though that was popular at the time. Um, it, it, it was a tough upbringing, um, especially since I guess Lizzie and her sister decided that they probably should be living a little bit nicer considering how much, you know, how important and how much money their father had. Um, so her older sister was named Emma. They had, they were very religious. Um, when Lizzie Borden was younger, she was involved in all sorts of um, church activities, including teaching Sunday school. Um, she actually taught recent immigrants to the United States, who at the time probably would have been more, maybe probably Irish. Um, 
She worked for, let me see, she worked for the Christian Endeavor Society. She worked for the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And oddly, she was a member of the Ladies Fruit and Flower Mission, which I, I just what found What the delightful. hell? <laughs> I thought that was lovely. Fruit and the flower flowers. Mission. The Ladies Fruit and Flower Preaching mission. to the was, vegetation, huh? I, it was associated with her church. Um, so, so basically, um, after... Um, after her, her natural mother died, her father remarried someone called Abby. Now, Lizzie didn't call her mom or stepmom. She called her Mrs. Borden. It was very, Ooh. it was a very sort of strange relationship right from the very beginning. Um, mm -hmm. They, but then also at the time, the the girls were getting older. So Lizzie and Emma were very were getting older. Their father actually then um, bought another house and. The back of the the back of the house on the upstairs was where the um, parents lived, so the, the the father and mother. And then there was a door connecting that to another bedroom, which had actually been bolted shut, like absolutely bolted, and you could not use it. And then um, Lizzie and Emma got to use the front part of the house, so they had their own little parlor, they had their own entrance. Um, they very rarely ate with their parents, so they they kind of led their own lives. They were fairly independent. So so kind of like you know uh, renters are, kind of you know, yeah yeah roommates yeah. more than family yeah mm. so that's strange yeah i yeah it just was i guess um they were older they didn't i guess they just didn't want to be living in the same living area as their parents they wanted a bit of independence and apparently even though the dad was fairly frugal, agreed and set up the house like this because he, he boarded the, the door between their rooms. So, um, mm. But tension had been growing by this point. So a couple of things sort of contributed to, or at least they're saying contributed. So one was an episode where um, Andrew, the father, killed a bunch of pigeons that were in his barn. Um, he killed them with a hatchet, believing that they were attracting local children to come in and, you know, trying to shoot them. Um, now, Lizzie had actually recently built a roost for the pigeons so she liked them. She wanted them there, and he mm. went and killed them all. So, uh, mm. apparently, so, apparently, so what kind of what kind of what was the approximate age of Lizzie at this point? Uh, this was eighteen ninety two. So she would be when she born. Uh, 32, 33. Yeah. Oh, that's so, yeah. They were okay. So they, at they were, that they were, time, they she was quite living. old to still be single. Well, that's what I say. That's what I mean. They were both. They were both women. They were older women. They had their own lives. They were living in their parents' house, but they were living sort of apart. They yeah. didn't eat with the family. They they had their own lounge, their own sitting room, etc. But yeah, it, they were they were spinsters, I guess. I, I hate that word. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I mean, yeah. that was the term of the time. That's what people would have yeah. called them. Yeah, absolutely. Is there, is there any explanation as to? Why? They there's, were... spec there's speculation that Lizzie was a lesbian. Um, there were. There's, she was there's a lesbian? No, <laughs> uh, there's no proof whatsoever. Um, there were a couple of people that might have commented on it um, at the time, but there's just there's no proof at all. It's all okay. complete speculation. Um, there's the movie well, that we were talking about. Was, isn't that so often the, you know, the go-to explanation for independent women? Yeah. Yep. You know what they should have done? They should have just tied her up, thrown her in a lake, and seen if she floated or not. I thought that was the <laughs> test for lesbianism. Oh God. No witchcraft, <laughs> witches. Yeah, that's not get witches. See if she weighs the same as a duck. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> You got a Need our duck slew. scale. You got a whole slew of unlikes and thumbs down coming for that comment, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> Only it, kidding, it in, YouTube it was, land. In, it was all in jest because of the ridiculous yes. belief system. I know, of the I know. Day. But baseless claims have been made that and that Lizzie was a lesbian. I've not heard anything about her sister. I think they were just independent women, mm -hmm. and I just think I don't know. Maybe they were. Um, under their father's thumb a little bit because he was fairly strict with them. They were very, very religious. Um, so I don't know. It's all speculation at this point. Um, but anyway, the, the trouble started with, so Andrew, the father, killed all these pigeons that Lizzie had recently set up a, a, a roost for. Um, 
he'd also when Andrew married Abby, they also suspected that maybe her father was marrying him for his wealth. Um, but nothing was ever proven. And then later he started giving over gifts of real estate to branches of his wife, his wife's house. So that didn't add to things. Um, there was some sort of family argument in 1892 that um, both sisters took um, extended vacations away from New Bedford. Um, they, When they came back, I guess things were still tense. Lizzie, um, Emma moved back to the house. Lizzie actually chose to stay in a boarding house for almost a week before she actually moved back to the house. So something was going on. Yeah. So these, like this is in things the, were the tense. Up to the, yeah. The, so this is, we're talking in the weeks up to the murders. So, um, so the week before the murder is when they actually re returned from whatever this huge um, upset was. And that's when the week before is when she decided she was going to stay in the boarding house for a few days before actually even going home. Wow. So, so where so, do people get the idea that Andrew Borden was inappropriate with them? There's, um, again, there's hints of it. They wouldn't have talked about that at the time. Incest was just, it just was not spoken out loud. Like, but there right. were mutterings, um, let me, I think, I don't think any of the newspapers actually came out and said it, but there were a few mutterings about, you know, just people um, commenting on it. Like, you know, the newspaper will go after the local relatives and they'll be, oh, well, we think there might have been something, in, you know, inappropriate going on. But there was nothing officially declared or, or proven. Mm -hmm. were, were there um, well-known euphemisms that could be, that were used in, re in newspaper reports? No, it wasn't even, it, it didn't even have a euphemism. It just, it was wow. so disgusting that it was just not talked about, not written about, not even there. So there were hints, but even, but that was it. That's all I've got. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. So it, it, again, there's, a, I think that's one of the fascinations with Lizzie, even though you, you can prove that she did it or, well, you can't quite prove that she did it, but the, the evidence is so overwhelming that we're going to say, yes, she did it. Um, but there's so much other stuff going on that you could study this woman forever. Like you could study for, for years hmm. and still never know. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, yep. like, it's like Jack the Ripper. Why is Jack the Ripper so fascinating? Because it's never been solved. This right. one's been solved, but uh, well, has it? There's just so much going on. Um, so anyway, there's, there's all this tension going on in the months before the murders. There's this huge blow up in July. Um, the sisters all disappear for, they disappear for a couple of weeks and then come back. Lizzie is so upset apparently still that she decides she's going to stay in a rooming house for a little while before even returning to the residence. Um, so a couple of days before the murder, the entire household became ill and Abby, the stepmother thought that maybe they had all been poisoned because Andrew was not a popular man. He made a lot of enemies. He pissed off a lot of people. So really? it wouldn't have been surprising. Yeah. yeah like yeah, in business had... or personal or personal both? and business. It, personal and business. He just wasn't a very nice man to deal with. Um, oh. Very strict, very grim face, apparently. Um, but the fact that Abby, the, the stepwife, or sorry, the stepmother, actually feared that they'd been poisoned showed that she was aware of her husband's reputation. <laughs> they actually tested the bodies afterwards, and no one had been poisoned. I'll give you that spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> But she... just in case, just in case it comes up that oh maybe maybe uh, Lizzie tried to kill her family in, in a in a previous attempt, there was no sign of poison at all. They think that um, yeah, that some sort of lamb or something had been left out and they ate it and it gave them all food poisoning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they've got a friend arrive. Um, so August fourth, they have a friend arrive, um, and he stays overnight. And he leaves about quarter, he leaves about nine, maybe quarter to nine the next morning. Um, he's going to visit his, he's a, a distant relative. And, oh, I think he's a relative of their, their, their natural mother. Anyway, um, after that, he leaves, they're cleaning. Um, one of the maids is asked to go upstairs and clean all of the windows. Um, Abby goes upstairs to clean the guest room that this Morse guy has just been in. Now, this is where, this is where she died. Now, this is where we, we don't quite know what happened. So, according to forensics, she was facing her killer at the time of the attack. She was hit on the side of the head, so it's likely the person was right-handed. Um, and then the hatchet cut her just above the ear, so she was hit on the side. And then the blow spinned her. She fell down. She hit her face on 
the floor. And then the killer then hit her 17 more times in the back of the head. So that's 18 blows, not 40. Yeah. <laughs> It's still they, quite a bit of overkill. That's it's a still, lot. It's a, yeah, yeah, especially since the first one probably killed her. But anyway, you know, one or two more at most probably needed. But yeah. So, um, so just to to emphasize this point, that's often an indication of you know personal rage against yeah. the individual and yeah. not a stranger. Yeah, absolutely. In. Sort of some sort of hatred. Yes. Yeah, if it was a crime of opportunity, it would have been quick. Um, you know, it might have, might have not even have been a death. It might have been just knock her out, get out of there. But no, this right. was 18 hits, 17 to the back of the head. <laughs> so wow. at this point, um, so this point, this is probably around, I don't know, they reckon it's sometime between 9 and 1030 a.m. in the morning, like in the morning. So the husband, Andrew, the father's gone out for his morning walk at 9. He returns around 1030. Um, his key failed to open for some reason. So his key wouldn't work in the door. The maid went to unlock the door and she found it jammed, which was kind of weird. Um, she would later testify that she heard giggling up on the stairs where Lizzie was. Now she didn't see Lizzie up there. She just said, Oh, she heard giggling. So that came into the, um, what do you call it? The, the trial as well. So they finally got the father in and he said he was a little bit tired and he was going to go in and sit down on the couch and maybe have a snooze. So according to Lizzie, she helped him remove his boots, um, helped him into his slippers, and he laid down on the sofa for a nap. Now, well, this comes up well, later. Well, I, I was just it, looking at the picture in, in the, the stream, yeah, and he had his shoes pictures, on. He's got his boots on, yeah. So that was a... <laughs> Oopsie. But that, we'll, we'll, come back, we'll come back to why that may be. Um so basically, everything these were attacked. I won't go into well. Basically, um, the maid said that she was um, on the third floor. She was resting from cleaning because she wasn't feeling very well that day. And she heard around eleven o'clock. She heard Lizzie from downstairs. Maggie, come quick! Someone's you know someone's murdered father. Father's dead. Someone came in and killed him. Um, he was struck ten or eleven times with a hatchet-like weapon. One of his eyeballs had been split cleanly in two, suggesting that he'd been asleep when attacked. And he was still bleeding. So um, Abby, her blood had congealed, so she'd been there a little while, but he was still bleeding. So it was very, very, very recent. Mm. Um, so they estimated that his death occurred about 11 o'clock. Now, Lizzie Borden, when she was questioned, um, her, her answers were all over the place. Um, she reported hearing a groan at one point, but then two hours later when they talked to her about the same thing, she just said she didn't hear anything. Um, uh, she said, where's the rest of them? At one point she said she went out and another point she said she stayed in. Um, she said her stepmother had been called out to visit someone who was sick um, when in fact she'd been upstairs dead. So um, she was kind of all over the place and she kind of pissed people off because she was like very poised. She wasn't nervous or trembling <clears throat> or nothing. She was so poised that people were like, oh, okay, that's a bit weird. Um, well, nope. the, the, the shifting testimony is something that modern investigators would latch on to immediately as, oh, God, yeah. As, yeah. as a clue that somebody's making shit up. And this is even before she's convicted. Yeah. Did they bother to secure the crime scene? No, I was just going to get into that, actually. Um, this whole yeah. thing reminded me of Velisca. Yeah, SK, and not just because oh, of the acts, yeah. but because of all the people who walked through it yeah, after. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I thought about that as well. But the fact of the matter is they didn't actually um, they didn't actually go. They didn't check for clothing. They didn't do a proper search of the house. Even despite the fact that her like she was acting a bit weird and she kept changing her story, they never went and checked any of this. So no one knows. They didn't bother to check anybody for bloodstains and look for the dress that she might have been wearing, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, they searched her room, but basically it was just like, oh, check under the pillow. Yeah, there's nothing here. Wow. And I'm sure they didn't keep people from coming in either. No, they didn't. But they Probably also quite they, the contrary. People were probably well, trooping through the house to take a look. Well, yep. that, well they, they kept all the other people out while they were investigating. But the reason they said they didn't do a proper search of the room is because Lizzie said she wasn't feeling well and wanted to go lie down. So they went, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh-huh. They were they were they were persuaded in the press for it. Believe me. <laughs> yeah, police. Uh, you know, murder investigation procedures were all over the map in those days. Uh, yeah, a little bit. They hadn't quite got mm-hmm. procedural stuff together yet. It, we're just we're just on the cusp of having procedures sort of written down and, and followed, and just on the cusp of like you know forensics getting interesting and stuff. So really, there wasn't. Yeah, they were just doing. What they weren't they even were, just so people know. They weren't even fingerprints were not even a no. thing in those days. Nope. No. No. So they did. They did continue searching. They, in the basement, they actually did find um, two hatchets, two axes, and a hatchet head that had a broken handle. Which I'm hoping you have a picture of. I don't know. Did you get a no, picture of that we, one? We did okay. not. It, it's interesting because later in the trial, what they do is they actually take the broken handle. They said that that it um, it was suspected of being the murder weapon because the break on it was fairly fresh, and um, they it, there was like. Um, dust and stuff put on it. It looked like it had been found deliberately to make it look like the axe hadn't had been there for a long time. But was there blood? Um, there was no blood, but they reckon the handle had bro- been broken off because there was blood on, probably blood on the handle, and it's a little bit harder to get blood off wood than it is off metal. You just clean the metal when it comes off. And they didn't have, you know, that. Oh, so you're saying it was a broken axe head, not a broken axe handle? Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. It was a, it was a hatchet head. Okay. And the handle had been completely broken off, so there was no gotcha. handle at all. There was a little splinter of wood, and then you had the the actual hatchet head, and it had been cleaned. Um, there was no blood on it, but then it looks like someone had put a bunch of dust on on purpose to make it look like it had been in the barn for ages or the basement. Hmm. So um, they, after this, they started looking a little bit more closely. Um, the same night that all of this, so after the investigation was done, um, they had a friend stay over, this, um, someone called Alice Russell. She slept with them um, because, you know, it was all still a big deal and everything. And there were also um, pol- a police presence outside the house just to keep an eye on the place. And police um, said that they said Borden enter the cellar with um, Alice Russell, the friend, carrying a kerosene lamp and a slot pail. And then he saw both of them leave, and then Borden went back in, and then he said she looked like she was bending over sink, but he couldn't, you know, he couldn't really see what she was doing. So just speculation like that probably didn't help her, you know, probably didn't help the case very much. Um, She was also, the next morning, um, uh, her friend came down and saw her tearing up a dress and putting it into the fire because she said it was covered with paint. Now, Russell didn't see any didn't see the dress didn't see there was blood on the dress or anything but when she asked lizzie what she was doing lizzie said there's paint on this dress i'm burning it that seems (laughs) out of the ordinary shall i say um i'm thinking you get paint on a dress you use it as a paint rag you don't burn it Right. You cut it up, you repurpose it. Yeah. Um, especially back then. I mean, especially what? back then, especially back then. Um, but, you know, for a long time after way back then, um, yeah. people people didn't just throw clothes out or burn them. Fabric was, and fabric so was costly. Yeah. And, you know, um, there was a there was an ethic of reuse. But did that really exist among the moneyed classes, like the Bordens would be? Well, they were moneyed classes, but she'd grown. I remember, her father only died the day before, so they were still living in this house with no electricity and no indoor plumbing, and so they weren't. They they didn't have access to all of this money. He pretty much kept them in a poor neighborhood with no money. Oh. Um, it, that changed after. That changed after the trial. I, I can tell you, they actually they actually did move to the hill where all the wealthy people were. But we'll get to that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I I just think just um, I don't. I think even if you did have money, you would still either find some. You know, she was a church person. She could have found a church. Someone at the church to look at use it for something. Or right. I don't know. I I I find it hard to believe she would be burning it because it had paint on it. Yeah, flux of paint doesn't ruin an entire garment's worth of fabric that could be. Well, no, objectively down not. For, it could be cut down for a a girl's dress, for example. Or something, yeah. Even or like, worst the worst worst case scenario, you have a cleaning rag. Right. 
I don't know. Anyway, she, um, she. I mean, how many other dresses did she burn? Probably none. (laughs) Probably none. Yeah. Um, so, so there was an inquest, um, she had been at this point taking regular doses of morphine to calm her nerves. So the whole thing actually was affecting her. So it's possible that her, t- well, it's more than likely, likely that her testimony was affected by this. So her behavior oh. was erratic. She sometimes didn't answer questions, even if they were going to benefit her. Um, she, her story was all over the place. Sometimes when her father was, was it when her father arrived home, she said that she'd been in the dining room doing some ironing. Then she claimed to have been coming down the stairs Again, this is where the, the removing the boots. She said she removed the father's boots and put the slippers on, but obviously that didn't happen. Um, and the district attorney that was questioning her was very, very, very aggressive. Um, but still, there was enough evidence to charge her. So on August 11th, which was, what are we talking, a couple of days later, but a week after the murder, she was served with a warrant of arrest. She was put in jail. Um they still, newspaper articles are still pointing out that she doesn't react. She's very stoic. She's very calm. She's very, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I got I, I need to make a point here that that is often used by investigators as an indication of a person's guilt or innocence. And that's really un, super unfair because well, I was gonna not say, everybody yeah. reacts yeah. The, the way that you think they're supposed to act, react to tragedy. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I know. And to that, me, to me, out. it's a, it's a, it's a huge assumption that everybody reacts the same way. And it's not yeah. at all true. Um, whether she did it or not, that's a, that's a, you know, that's an unfair um, assessment of her guilt. Yeah, well, that's that's the the newspaper articles at the time. So you know they want to sell newspapers, don't they? Absolutely. Same, uh, same as now. Same as now. Um, so basically, well, she and was... and and even you know, police in those days they needed to get somebody in jail for a crime, so they yeah. would use whatever means they could find, and they didn't necessarily care who, <laughs> you know, who it was that went to jail, just yeah. like today. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, okay, so basically um, the inquest was huge. It was all over the newspapers. It was basically another nationwide um, thing, just like uh, just like Lizzie Halliday was. All the newspapers were writing about it. Mm-hmm. Um, the Boston Globe actually had a three-page, like three full-page write-up of this thing. Um, so that's how huge it was. Um, she was indicted. So she was... Um, she, they began giving evidence on at the beginning of November, and at the beginning of December, that was it. She was acquitted. Oh, so she was indicted. Sorry. Um, so she had to wait a year. So she was indicted on December second, but the trial didn't actually start until June fifth the following year. Was she in and, jail during this time well, or on, can, at home? I, I don't know. That's the weird thing. I cannot find out what happened to her. It seems like she just disappeared, and then she's back for the trial. I, and I, I'm not familiar with. Like if there were such things as bonds back then, could you be released on yeah I, bond I, or if that's a like... that's a very old tradition, yes. So maybe I don't know. She she maybe paid her own bond. She didn't have any parents to do it for. She didn't have a, a husband or boyfriend or family. Ten yeah. percent, but they usually don't um, issue him for murder charges. Oh, so maybe I don't know. I, I can't even find out if she was in prison. What prison she was in? It's it's just the weirdest thing. Hmm. Um, but anyway, her trial started on June 5th, the following year. And at the time people were like, I guess it had died down a little bit, but then it came up again. And at around the same time as the trial started, there was another ax murderer in the same area and sorry, an ax murder in the same area. And, um, they actually found that they actually, there were similarities, which I guess any ax murderer has wow. similarities. Yeah. It'll look like you're hacked to death with an axe. This was a nationwide issue at the time. Yeah, we, we did a whole show on it. Right. So there was Velisca for one, right? Well, definitely one. If you look at the Midwestern acts, man, that was and Velisca, that's another one. Yeah. Kansas, Missouri, Colorado, um, in Illinois too. And you had one in Austin was another big one. That was separate uh-huh. and yeah, just there, all over. There was speculation that somebody was riding the rails doing these 
a lot of these murders. Yeah, I heard that one as well. Well, this oh, and the New Orleans X Man as well was another one there. Oh, yeah, they covered that in American Horror Story. Um, we covered it too. <laughs> anyway, the um, I guess they thought there were similarities, and I'm like, okay, well, um, any two people that have been hacked to death with an axe are going to have similarities, right. especially back then. Of course, they're going to look the same. So they automatically um, thought that that she um, like that she hadn't done it because there was other, other, another, but they eventually found the guy who did it and um, they found out that he had never been in the vicinity of Fall River at the time of the Borden murder, so he was let off. So we're still looking at Lizzie. So um, so that's when we get back to, so when the, during the trial, they start talking about this axe head, um, the, ac- the hatchet head, the axe head that I, I mentioned earlier. Right. Um, so basically what they did is that they dug up her parents' bodies, who they'd have been buried at this point, and they took the heads and they cleaned the heads, like just the skulls, and they brought the skulls in to the actual trial. And they were showing how they had the axe head and they were showing how the axe head actually fits into the skull. Um, and that kind of make a huge impression. I mean, obviously the visual of having this. Yeah. You know, um, and at that point, <laughs> she kind of fainted and, you know, fell over because she's, understandably she's seeing her parents skulls here um so before they could actually kind of make their point she kind of fainted so i don't know if this is one of those oh woe was me and she fainted to get the attention off of what was going on in the court or whether she was actually in distress because she was seeing her parents skulls dug up right um but anyway um they everybody that we've talked about already sort of testified to the maid um the friend that stayed with her and witnessed the the dress being burnt um and the jury went out for uh, sort of <laughs> almost an obscene amount of time. They were out for two hours, but they'd actually decided um, that they'd made up their mind within sort of like 15, 20 minutes. But because they didn't want to seem like indelicate, they actually sat around and waited for another hour before coming out and announcing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I guess, I don't know. Um, so basically they said, no, she didn't do it. <laughs> I want to I want to draw a parallel to um, a modern case, and that being, um, and it comes to mind just because I was watching Dave Ch- Chappelle earlier, uh, O.J. Simpson. Yeah. And similar. Yeah. I I watched the entire trial because I was doing a. I uh, was starting up a business and I had, you know, I was at home all the time. <laughs> so I saw the whole trial. And by the end of that trial, when the, they sent the jury out to deliberate, I was like, I could not convict OJ based on what I saw in the trial. I would, n- I would okay. absolutely not convict him. And, and it had nothing to do with whether he did it or not. The, the fact was the state didn't prove it. Right. Um, you racist bastard. <laughs> How is that racist? Joe James Black. <laughs> mm. <laughs> the, so, yeah, and and it, so it reminds me of that. Where, you know, maybe she did it, but you, you got to be able to prove it. There's what you well, know that, and what you can prove. That's it. That's it. Exactly. Um, so basically after, after the trial, she actually, um, she, she wasn't, she was basically ostracized by everyone. So by Imagine. all the people in the church, everybody <laughs> that she lived with, she actually bought a house with her sister up in the hill, which is the, the neighborhood that she thought she should be living in. The wealthy neighborhood. Um, and yeah. they had a maid and like a, a driver and a coachman, etc. Et um, since Abby, since they said Abby died before the the father did, the stepmother, Abby's wealth went to the father, even though he died an hour later. And then all of the father's wealth went to the two sisters. Um, they paid off some of Abby's family a little bit, but a majority of it went to the sister, so they were able to buy the house and basically live a pretty good life. Um, Lizzie started, so she was completely ostracized. Um, she There was a, a bit of a, an accusation of shoplifting in 1897. 
yeah. then she started hanging around with um, an actress called Nancy O'Neill, who was oh. not acceptable um, society. She was well, no actress pretty... would be ex- unless well, yeah, you were like yeah. the most famous in the world. Then it was okay. Yeah, Nancy was a more actress than a lot of actresses. And when um, so when Lizzie started, she started. She's calling herself Lizbeth now, not Lizzie. So when Lizbeth. Um, she gave this huge party for um, Nancy O'Neill, the actress, and that was basically the last straw for Emma. Emma moved out of the house, and she actually never saw her sister again. Wow. Um, although she did she did die nine days after her sister did. So um, Lizzie had her um, gallbladder removed, and then she ended up getting pneumonia after that, and she died, and her sister died nine days later. From what causes was the sister? Um, it says that Emma died from chronic nephritis. She was 76. She was in a nursing home. Yeah, that'll do it. She moved to New Hampshire, um, for her health and sort of like just to renewed publicity. Another, uh, so another book had come out, um, when they were both quite old and there was about a bunch of publicity and Emma got dragged into it again and she didn't want anything to do with it. So she moved to New Hampshire, hoping that, you know, for her health and hoping that no one, you know, people would leave her alone. (laughs) Which they did, they, I'm um, sure. Which they, yeah, I'm sure. Um, the sisters were buried side by side in a family plot. So it says here, at the time of her death, Borden was worth over 250000 So in 2018, that was uh, $4,839,000. She owned a house on the corner of French Street and Belmont Street, several office buildings, shares in several utilities, two cars, and a large amount of jewelry. So um, she didn't just squander the wealth her father created. She expanded it. She, no, but the other funny thing is that everybody, so cousins and friends and stuff, all expected to get like a bit of her will. Yeah. And she actually left a majority of it to uh, the Fall River Animal Rescue League. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. I love that. Oh, I love Way that. to go, Lizzie. <laughs> Final yeah, her, fuck um, you a, did, a cousin the and a friend got some money, which would have been about one hundred and sixteen thousand in today's money. But the uh, but the yeah, the Fall River Animal Rescue got equivalent to five hundred and eighty one thousand dollars. Oh, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful yep. thing. <laughs> <laughs> so Way yeah, to go, she, um, she probably I, I mean, I think she probably did it because she was incredibly lonely. She I think she was fairly heavily under her father's thumb. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think she was incredibly unhappy. I don't think she, li- she obviously didn't like the stepmother. There'd obviously been some tension. Her father wasn't a very nice man. In fact, the, the stepmother thought that someone else had poisoned him because he was such a dick. Um, I think if she did it, she, I don't know. She paid for it in life she had afterwards. She was ostracized. No one would talk to her. She ended up hanging around with what was, virtually considered a prostitute at the time the actress right. and right. she died alone she had very few friends um you can see by her by her will she had one friend and one cousin she left some money to and everything else went to basically trusts and the fall river animal rescue league um i don't know i think she was probably quite sad after or lonely after the whole thing well, it sounds like she was pretty sad beforehand. I mean, exactly. but there, yeah, actually, the one thing right. that I haven't heard, though, is any kind of triggering event. You know, why well, people, why that day? Well, some people say it's because it was a couple of days after she arrived back after this vacation the two sisters took. And the vacation was a result of some family. Something happened. Yeah. So yeah, the there, pigeons. There's, the pig, a, there's the an pigeons, astro- there's a lot of, you know, personal family dynamics that, you know, was never, ever made public. No, and but the other thing was that the pigeons. So mm. when you think about it, when she's, when she's a young, when she's an old woman, she had a lot of animals as well. She had horses and dogs and cats, and um, she loved animals, absolutely loved animals. She left a majority of her fortune to the Fall River Animal Rescue League. So it makes sense that maybe as a sensitive woman, she's under her father's thumb. She doesn't like the new stepmother. She thinks all the money's, you know, being squandered on this new woman. And then he kills her pigeons. She specifically built a a place for these birds and he went and killed them all. And what if, what if there was an, a sense that she made him do it? I don't understand. 
No, what what if the mother in law what oh. if she thought the mother in law made the father kill the birds? Right? I know. I mean, there's no. I, I, I'm I'm totally speculating here. Yeah, yeah. But that um, would that would be the kind of thing that might trigger that. Like, she if she overheard her, the the stepmom nagging her father to get rid of those damn pigeons. Yeah. Well, something something like a day or two after the pigeons caused a huge fight, and this both of the sisters left the house. Yeah. So something happened we just don't know what happened there was no one there except the family and nobody ever said and no one ever said so that's why there's just so much fascination what happened so even if you agree that yes she did it there's so much else going on like why did she do it and how did she do it and what happened and what was the right. argument about and what was the trigger that it gets it just it's like jack the ripper it just keeps going on and on and on yeah though there will never be answers to all of these questions. No, nope. unless some sort of secret diary of Lizzie Borden comes out. Hey, there, wait a minute, that's a writing idea. Someone want to take that and write with that? <laughs> uh, yeah, unless, unless some sort of secret diary of Lizzie Borden turns up, like the supposed secret diary of Jack the Ripper, then yeah, we're just not going to know. It's the Voynich uh, manuscript. <laughs> it was funny, actually. At the time of the trial, because um, temperance was becoming sort of a Oh, sorry, um, women were, were sort of grouping yeah. together and rallying, and it was just sort of the, the, the start of sort of like the suffragette movement and all that kind of, a little bit early for that, but still. Um, there's a quote here that says, uh, Lizzie's arrest provoked an uproar that quickly became national. Women's groups rallied to Lizzie's side, especially the Women's Christian Temperance Union and suffragettes. suffragists. Lizzie's supporter protested that at trial she would not be judged by a jury of her peers because women as non-voters did not oh. have the right to serve on juries. So she would be voted. She would be the try. The the jurors would all be men. Obviously, not her peers. So that's that was. I don't know. I thought that was a little interesting. Fair point too. Yeah. Yeah. That I have. When did women? Oh, actually, get... sorry. Hang on. I just found something. Um, okay, so she was arrested. Um, she, okay. Uh, she found herself confined to a cheerless nine and a half by seven and a half foot cell for the next nine months. There she was. Oh, okay. so she was in so jail she was, the whole yeah. time. She was in jail for the nine months. Yeah. Sorry yeah. about that. Okay. When did when were women allowed to be on juries in the U.S.? Oh, good question. Someone want to Google that quickly? <laughs> I'm just reading some of the um, some of the the quotes and stuff from newspapers that I, I love these things. Um, Lizzie's demeanor in court, um, which district attorney perhaps failed to fully anticipate, also influenced the income. Here lies a gender paradox of Lizzie's trial. In a courtroom where men reserved all the legal power, Lizzie was not a helpless maiden. She only needed to present herself as one. Her lawyers told her to dress in black. She appeared in court, tightly corseted, dressed in flowing clothes and holding a bouquet of flowers in one hand and a fan in the other. One newspaper described her as quiet, modest and well-bred. Far from a brawny, big, muscular, hard-faced, coarse-looking girl. That was a quote. Another stressed that she lacked Amazonian proportions. She could not possess the physical strength, let alone the moral degeneracy to wield a weapon with skull-cracking force. <laughs> I love newspapers. I love newspaper articles, <laughs> especially the old ones. She did not have the Amazonian proportions. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing about a sharp blade, though. You don't need a lot of strength. Yeah. Here, all and right, time, I'm going to read time, from memory.loc.gov. Okay. As late as 1942, only 28 states allow, state laws allowed women to serve as jurors, but oh, wow. these also gave them the right to claim exemption based on their sex. Civil yes. Rights Act of 1957 gave women the right to serve on federal juries, but not until 1973. Three could women oh serve God. on uh, juries in all 50 states? That's crazy. That is that insane. Is, that is crazy. I can't believe wow. it was that late. Yeah, we've come a long way, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Man, yeah, that's right? yeah, that's shocking. Wow. Okay. Well, there was absolutely no no chance of her getting a jury of repairs back then. then. Not for a hundred years, almost. <laughs> wow. 
Um, so yeah, that's um, I don't know. I I I feel a I don't feel any sympathy for Lizzie Halliday, but I really do feel some sympathy for Lizzie Borden. Now, having said that, I'm more familiar with Lizzie Borden. I kind of I've I you know I kind of have an intro, my, my interest in serial killers and killers right. and she's kind of been one of my favorites ever since I was little actually probably since I saw that <laughs> that Elizabeth Montgomery movie um and I've always felt that she might have been innocent but doing all the research for the show yeah it's definitely changed my mind I definitely think she did it but I still feel a sympathy for her well she isn't a serial killer nobody no, else no. two people died nobody else before or after were ever right. attributed to her. And before she apparently was like just this perfect daughter, this perfect woman. She went to church. She did all this Christian activities. And afterwards, apparently she also, she still tried to get involved, but the, the, the church basically shunned her. All her friends shunned her. She didn't have like any of the society that she, she had the support of in the beginning when they all thought she was innocent, when they all dropped away, that was it. None of them, even though she was um, found not guilty, that was it. That was the end of that, that part of her life. Wow, but then again, fascinating. Then again, I've seen then, I've seen better, uh, you know, acceptance of people who have been found guilty and served out their time. Oh uh, um, well, yeah, but it was what New England sort of a posh sort of society. I think they they were pretty tough with each other. Um, so. On the other hand, she she may not have had those that element of society, and to be honest, she might have been better off with it. But she got herself a big smack in house. She had servant. She had a you know a butler. She had apparently she read she read extensively. She had quite the library. Um, she had quite the social life with the actress, and you know that sort of thing. So maybe maybe she got the life she wanted. Yeah, maybe so. I mean, maybe it's all worth it. <laughs> That's not a recommendation to go out and do this yourself, boys and girls. Especially if daddy isn't rich. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, especially. <laughs> um, it might not turn out the way you planned. We've got it might not. plenty remember, of those they examples. Can, remember, they can see your fingerprints now. <laughs> They have that pink. They have that pink stuff they can drop on the floor, or the, the drops, and it turns pink if there's blood. You know, like right. just, just don't, just don't do it. There's so much forensics. Although I have to say, sometimes if I'm if I can't sleep, I like to sort of plan the perfect murder, have just you to see if I can. It out? Like in my head, oh, I've got some pretty cool ideas. <laughs> the problem with the perfect murder is the body. It's always yeah. the body. And that, and handling that is so much dependent on chance. Like if somebody just happens along or something and sees something, right? Yeah. But the bodies leave behind an awful lot of evidence. They do. So you so, got to get rid of it. I mean, That's my point is you got to get rid of the body and getting rid of the body is fraught with peril. Well, in in my scenario, you don't actually get rid of the body. You just make it look like an accident. Oh, I see. Yeah. I think we lost Mr. West somewhere along the line. Oh, dear. I'm here. Oh, we okay. We went, we went off tangent again, and, and we lost him. Okay, so, just... yeah, I mean, that's, that's – um, I love the story of um, – Lizzie Halliday, and I've noticed there's a couple of movies about her that I'm, I plan on going back and watching just because I want to see other people's interpretation of her. Um, I'm fascinated by her. I, I really don't have a lot of sympathy for her, except that I'm still not 100% certain she was faking the madness. But um, Lizzie Borden, I'm still, I don't know, I, I kind of have a soft spot for her. <laughs> Understood. Not, you know... Don't do murder. That's the lesson of this show. <laughs> murder. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, it might turn out, but you can't count on that. Nobody, you know, you. It's it's a, it's a big gamble. But when you think about it, Jen, you guys, I think you throw around the statistic about how many active serial killers there actually are in the Ameri in America right now. Yeah. There's like, isn't there like a couple of hundred? Uh, from my understanding, the FBI stats are that there are, you know, two to three hundred active 
in the okay, US so at any given why, time. Why haven't they been caught? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, for one, um, you know, uh, a, a lot of the people who go missing are never found. So there's nothing yeah. to work from. Um, <laughs> somebody, there was some meme a while back that suggested that the, w there are just as many female serial killers as male serial killers. They're just better at hiding it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I believe, I believe that. We sit and think very carefully and we believe in the whole revenge best served cold idea. So, yeah, you never know. Two years later, you know, right. this is off. Two years later, you, you never see it coming because we planned it that amount of time. Well, see, that would have been my, you know, my thinking as a f father of two daughters was, you know, if if somebody ever did anything to hurt my girls. Um, yeah. I, I wouldn't be the guy charging out there on the courthouse steps with a gun. I'd be the guy who made him disappear two years later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when nobody was looking. Just bide your time. Yep. Well, on that the first The her. first step of avoiding suspicion, detection is avoiding suspicion. Well, that's true, actually, yeah. Okay, I'm getting all kinds of good ideas here. Thanks. <laughs> we're all writers here, so it's okay. <laughs> yes, we're writers. Don't ever do any of this. <laughs> this is all for writing. <laughs> okay. Well, as always, Kelly, it's a it's great having you on the show. Thank and you. I love being on the show. We appreciate your inputs and your research and your thoroughness. Uh, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's always terrific having you. And we can't wait to have you back. Well, after about every chat that I'm on, that when, when I'm on the show, I keep mentioning or yelling out Lizzie Borden. So you finally did it. So thank you. <laughs> so we got that out of the way. <laughs> What's okay, next on your next? <laughs> on your favorites list? Oh, I found someone. I found someone very cool when I was researching these two women. So I'll have to. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'll have to get back to you on that. Sounds good. <laughs> all right. So let's all say good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Hit the like and share and uh, help spread the word of um, whatever this show is called, Real Monsters. <laughs> This is your host, baby.